teachings. Last week started this series that we're calling A New Day, and we began by just recognizing and understanding that's the kind of God that we have. It's the kind of God that we serve, that, that we have a relationship through Christ with Him, and it is His, His desire in life to give us fresh starts and new days in our life. And uh, today we, we began looking at various individuals in scriptures that experienced a new day with God. Today, because of sin that was in their life, but sometimes we need a new fresh start with God because of things that happened to us, not necessarily because of things we've done or the wrongful things we've done. And so, so every time we need a, a fresh start with God, it isn't necessarily because there's sin in our life. So we acknowledge that and we recognize that. And, and today we, we turn to a very familiar, if you've been in the faith very long, a familiar, very familiar passage. And it's in Psalm 51, but it unfolds in 2 Samuel chapter 11 and chapter 12. You remember that the, the, the Israelite army in 2 Samuel chapter 11, the Israelite army was gone to battle and had been gone to battle in the spring of the year for some time. And uh, they, were, they were fighting and one day David, while all of his um, soldiers and military was out fighting in the field one night, David walked out on his balcony and across the way he saw a beautiful lady named Bathsheba who was bathing at night. And David asked, well, who is that lady? And the servants told him, well, that is, that is Bathsheba, that is Uriah's wife. It's Uriah's wife. It's his wife. He said, bring her to me. So Bathsheba came to him and he slept with her and she became pregnant. So she sent word back to David and said, I'm pregnant. We got a problem. So David said, you know what? We're going to fix this problem. We're going to remedy that problem. We're going to hide what's taking place here and the sin that is in this situation. So instead of that, I'm going to bring Uriah back. So he calls, sends a message to Joab, who's in charge of the army, says, bring Uriah back so that he can be with his wife. So he brings her back. He has dinner with, with David. David gives him a gift, sends him home and says, now go home and rest for the night. Well, he goes home and he rests at the night and he sleeps at the door of his house instead of going in and being with Bathsheba, who was beautiful. And he had been out in the field in the spring of the year for a long time. David calls him back the next morning. He says, what's up? You slept at the door of your house. Now, this is Buddy Chamber Prayer for you, trying to save us some time. What's up? Why, why didn't you go in and sleep with your wife? He said, how can I sleep with my wife? Joab and all my military and all my soldiers and all my comrades, they're sleeping in tents and even the Ark of the Covenant's in a tent. How am I going to go in and sleep in my, in my own house and have time and intimate relationship with my wife? Can't do it. So David said, come back to eat supper with me again tonight. So he brings back, eat supper with him tonight. And he eats supper with him this time. He brings in a little Budweiser, Miller Lite or something. I don't know what he brought. He got him drunk. He said, surely if I get him drunk, he's going to go and sleep with his wife. He didn't sleep with his wife. He didn't sleep at the door, door of his house. He went and slept with the over, other servants of David's palace in David's kingdom. So he sends him back out to fight with a note. Give this to Joab. Basically, Joab, when the military gets fighting and things are really intense, put, put your eye in the front, pull all your troops back, and allow them to be killed. And that's exactly what happened. That's in 2 Samuel chapter 11. Everything's great. Bathsheba mourns, of course. She brings back her, he, he, he brings Bathsheba, David brings Bathsheba into the palace, and it's his eighth wife that we know of. The Bible says he has other wives. If one's not enough, he wants Bathsheba so that he can have not seven, but eight wives. That's the way sin works, by the way. So God speaks to his prophet Nathan. He says, Nathan, I want you to tell David this story. So Nathan goes and confronts King David and said, King David, there is a wealthy, wealthy man traveling through town. There's a poor man. The wealthy man has all kind of livestock, all kind of wealth. The poor man has one little lamb. I, uh, th this, this is made for movie stuff right here. Has one little lamb. This lamb sleeps with him. He plays with his children. The owner of this poor, this, this lamb, this poor owner feeds this lamb out of his own hand. And when he's eating supper, kind of like some of you do your dogs and cats, when he's eating supper, he feeds the little lamb. It's part of the family. 
So this rich, wealthy man with all these flocks comes into town and they, they need to, this poor man needs to provide meal for him. So the rich man says, kill his lamb. It's a part of the family. But you take it to the veterinarian and get his teeth brushed. That kind of lamb. Take it there and kill him and we're going to eat him. David became furious. Became furious and said, I can't believe that that man's life should be required of him for what he did to that poor family. And then the prophet of God. I wonder if he had that little wiry finger. I don't know. He said, David, you are the man. After all that God has done for you, after all that God has given you, you took, you had, listen, you had seven wives, but you took Uriah's one wife and you made her pregnant. And then you killed him. And you tried to hide it. You are the man. And David, straight up, I have sinned before the Lord. He sinned before the Lord. You think, whew, I'm looking pretty good compared to David, right? I mean, whoo, man, life's all right. But we all have sin in our life, and all of God's people said, amen. amen. We all have the things that all that God has done for us, all the blessings in our life and the goodness of God in our life. We still have sin in our life, things that we just look into the face of God and say, you know what, that's not enough for me. All that you've done, I want that. We have sin in our life. So what do we do with that? Well, then you turn to Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is a result of 2 Samuel chapter 11 and chapter 12. It's David coming clean with God, and David comes clean with God, first of all, just by, and there's just three points this morning, and all of God's people said, whew, thank you. First, we got to accept responsibility. If you're going to get right with God, if you're going to have a new day with God, you've got to accept responsibility. Amen. Got to accept responsibility. I've got somebody blowing my phone up. I don't know who it is. Not right now. But every week or so, I get this text. And it's two girls' names. Hey, we'd like to buy your house. And not only do they want to buy my house, they named the address of where I live. And we want to buy your, not only do they want to buy my house and name the address of where I live, they have my cell phone number. I try to hide my cell phone number from God. I mean, I, I don't give out my cell phone number, but they've got my cell phone number. They've got, they, they know where I live. They want to buy my house, they think. And I think, my house isn't for sale. Leave me alone, you know. But I'm not going to respond to them because then they'll think, ah, oh, well, he, he really is an individual. And, but, and it may be one of you wanting to buy my house. If you do, you don't have enough money, okay? Just go ahead and tell you. I mean, that's just, it's not for sale. But anyway. It, it, it just drives me nuts that people kind of invade our privacy, you know? I mean, they, 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 they invade our, our, our areas of life that you think, I don't want you to know where I live. I don't want you to know where I live. I don't want you to know my cell phone number. I don't want you to send me text all the time wanting to buy my house. It just kind of invades our privacy. But listen, that doesn't work with God. You can't, in, God knows you can't hide, David, you cannot hide your sin. God knows what you've done. Even though we try to cover up our sin, God knows that. And we've got to come to a point in our lives that we accept that. We accept the responsibility. And you can see that in verses 3 through 5. David said, listen, listen, I know. Circle that word, I. Yeah. I know Bathsheba's transgressions because she shouldn't have gotten on that balcony and bathed in the middle of the night. No, no, no. I know what? my transgressions i know my transgressions for my sin is always before me and against you and you only have i sinned and done what is evil in your sight and so that you are proven right and speak and justified when you judge surely i was sh sinful at birth sinful from the time my mother conceived me listen pay attention watch the blame game watch the blame game because david comes clean he accepts his he didn't blame it on bathsheba you know what we'd say today? Well, Nathan, he, he, you should have heard his tone of voice, God, of how he talked to me. You, he, he didn't have to be quite so confrontational, God. I mean, we would have blamed it on the prophet of God coming to, you know, even today, some of you, you sit in church and the word of God is proclaimed to you and you get offended because of what could have said, should have been said, how it should have been said, and on and on and on and say, listen, this is the word of God. 
And we just want to play the blame game of, well, well, if Joab would have gotten his job done, those military guys would have been back and he would have been with it. I mean, he would just on and on and he could have come up with excuse after excuse after excuse after excuse. Cut it out. You sinned. Straight up. You've sinned and you've done what is wrong and just quit blaming the, the just, just blaming everything else and everything around him. And even Nathan said, David, you had all of this. And it wasn't enough. You still sinned. You still turned your back on God time and time and time again. Poor little lamb, poor Uriah. All he had was Bathsheba, and you took it out of your greed and selfishness. That's seven of her wives you could have been with, eight other wives you could have been in. The Bible says, and more. We don't know how many wives he had. He had his pick of the litter. No, he wanted Bathsheba against you. And you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Accept responsibility. If I could show you the things that Lynn and I watch on TV, you would, you would know that we're certifiably weird. We, we, we are. It's, it's, it's the swamp people. It's deadly as catch. It's gold rush. It's all those highly intellectual things that we watch. Sometimes the History Channel, if it's the men that made America or the factories that made America, somewhere that's intriguing to us. But sometimes I'm flipping through channel, which is a gift of God that I have, and there's a show that comes on called Meekum Auto Sales, Auto Auctions. Do you ever watch Meekum? Anybody ever watch Meekum? They take this piece of junk and they restore it. And 30, 40 years ago, it cost $5,000. But today we're going to pay $80,000 for it. We may pay $120,000 for it. Sometimes $800,000 or a million dollars for a piece of metal, a car. And I like that. I'm intrigued by it. I'm intrigued by who would spend that kind of money on an automobile. But I'm intrigued about what all went involved in, in, in restoring and, and bringing back to life that old hunk of rust. That old just dilapidated piece of car and they restore it back and now it brings a fortune of money. And most of them, they don't ever drive. I mean, you don't take it to Wendy's to get a hamburger. You put it in a garage or a museum or something like that and you just look at it. If man can restore things like that, what can God do in your life and in my life? When we just accept responsibility and say, God, against you and you only have a sin, God says, oh, watch what I can do. And he does that. And, 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 and we've got to seek that same thing in our life. Whether we feel like an old rotten piece of furniture or we feel like a car or we feel like a, 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 a home renovation that you watch those shows on TV and, and we, 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 how we feel ourselves, God is, God is a God of restoration. That's just who he is. And in verse 1, even David, as he began this, said, you know what? God, have mercy on me. God, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love, according to the great compassion. Blot out my transgression. Just cover it up. Make it go away. Blot out my transgression. We seek that restoration, and we seek God's mercy in our life. Growing up, I worked in the, in the iron business. Scrap iron business. I, I grew up from uh, about 14, 15 till into college. And every summer, every time I was out of school, I had a torch in my hand, a big old long torch. And I would cut metal up and we'd put it on trucks and we would, we would take it to scrap yards and they would shear it. And most of it went to Chicago to be re, 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 melted down and, 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 and reused again. And, and that, was, that was my life. But sometimes they would bring in cars and they would just, they would just dump them into big crushers and big shearers. They would call it and it would just just devour it and sometimes we think that's the kind of God is that God's just a shearer and he just destroys our life and just in just just no 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 that's not who God is God is a God of restoration he wants to restore our life he doesn't want to shred you he doesn't want to crush you he's a God of restoration God have have mercy on me it's the kind of God that we have and David prayed for that. God, I, I need you. I just need your, I don't need your justice. I need your mercy. Have mercy on me. Verse 2, he says, well, God, would you not only have mercy on me, would you cleanse me? 
Would you wash away my iniquity? Would you cleanse me from my sin? I've accepted responsibility. I respect against you and you only have a sin. And God, I need your mercy. I need your cleansing in my life. He repeats that in verse 7. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. And then in verse 10, he says, God, would you create in me a pure heart? Would you renew a steadfast spirit? Would you restore me? That word is it's kind of a weird word. We, we, we think of create as you, you take something out of nothing and you just create it, right? I mean, you just, you just create a home. You, you create a model. You create a dish. You create all. I mean, you just, you just create things. That word create literally means to tear down. It literally means to, to, to cut it down, to, to, to break it down. But then he said, God, would you create in me a pure heart? Would you, would you rebuild this, this pure heart in my life? Would you renew a steadfast spirit within me? That word renew means to rebuild. God, I, I, I want you to get rid of some things in my life. I want mercy in my life. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. God, it's me and you, and I, I, need, you to, I need you to tear down my heart. I need you to, to recreate it because it's, it's filled with sin. It's filled with self-centeredness, David could say. It's filled with rebellion. It's filled with regret. And God, I need you to remove that, and I need you to renew it and, and rebuild it back. Have mercy on me, God, and cleanse me and, and take this heart that's full of self-centeredness and, and murder and, and adultery and, and lack, of, lack of integrity. God, I want you to take all that away and I want you to rebuild it back. Rebuild a steadfast spirit within me in my life. And then he wants to take our story and make it his story. He wants to take our mistakes and use it as our testimony. He wants to take everything we've done wrong and say, now, 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 teach others what you've done in your life. And we must desire that. We must desire that God could use us again. And we're open to that usefulness. We must desire that. Verse 13, that was verses 2 and 7 and 10. We roll to verse 13. It says, then I will teach transgressors your ways. Then, then I, David said, then I will teach transgressors. That's who I was, I am. Second Samuel chapter 11 and 12. Then I will teach transgressors your ways because I have, I have lived them. I have experienced them. You have created and you've rebuilt in my life and you've torn it down and you've rebuilt it. And now I'm going to teach others that are just like me. We're all in this together. I'm going to teach others that are just like me your ways of what you have done in my life and how you have renewed me and shown me mercy and, and changed my life. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will turn back to you. Save me from my blood guilt, O God, the God who saves me and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. I want to be used because I, I, I've learned some things. I, I've learned some lessons in my life and I want to use those lessons that I've learned about you to teach other people. And not only that, I'm going to invest in other people. I'm going to invest in their lives and transform their lives. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and, and sinners will turn back to you because I'm going to teach them that. I'm going to invest in them. I'm going to invest in these transgressors and these sinners because I am I'm one of those. You're one of those. Amen? Amen. It's a little weak, but you are. We all are. We, we, we all need our Savior. We're all sinners who need our Savior. And that's the kind of God that we have, that, that we can teach transgressors. Listen, God has restored you and renewed you in your life, but you just, you, you're just too embarrassed to tell anybody. That's not God, God wants you to teach transgressors His ways, that you can come along people who have experienced the very same thing you have, and you can help them of pointing them to God and what He's done in their lives. To teach transgressors your ways and sinners will turn back to you. Save me from my blood guilt, O oh God, the God who saves me. And my tongue will what? Sing your praises. A tongue will sing your praises. That you'll, you'll come to church and feel comfortable. 
Because you know the person to your left and to the right, they're sinners too. Oh, they come with all their finest on and they act like everything's great and they hadn't even thought of a cuss word in six years. But you know that's not true. You know it's not. We're all sinners. We're all transgressors. We're all trying to take our story and make it his story. And we will sing of his praises. We will worship and our worship will be real. Why? Because of what he has done in your stinking lives. It's amazing to me, the people that don't even try to worship God. I wonder, do you even know what God has done for you in your life? Do you even know the restoration that he has done in your life, that you were blind and now you see, you were dead and now you're alive, you were doomed to hell and now you have eternity in heaven? It ought to well up something in your heart and get rid of that piousness that is in your life that you're just going to sit there and listen to worship. No, no, no. We are worshiping, then I will sing of our righteousness of your righteousness. My tongue will sing of that. My worship, whether at home in my closet or whether in church, it will, it will be real. Somebody once said that great sin, great sin calls for great compassion from a great God. Our great God will show you great compassion when we recognize that we have great sin in our lives. Let's pray together.